start streaming the projector. But what I want to do is bring up this other thing because I didn't answer them last time. Um, uh, ba -ba -ba -da. Since that's this is what they did their discussion on. Um, had a lot of answers for uh, the continuum, which there were a lot of uh, good responses as to why uh, that it doesn't have historical significance, which, fair. Um, and like as a historical preservation site, yeah, Stonehenge is definitely considered a historical preservation site. But as a definition, history is, as I told you guys, um, actually, let me make sure this is even recording before I'm... Okay, that's recording. Is it recording on my live stream? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> back to this, sorry. Um, whoop, wrong one. What? Here. Okay. Uh, as a definition, history is written record. Uh, we have no written record for Stonehenge. We have written record for the Colosseum. We have obviously have written record for the Continuum. We have no written record for who built Stonehenge, why they built Stonehenge, when they built Stonehenge. We have ideas. We have inferences, but that's mostly like archaeological and uh, like anthropological evidence as opposed to like people writing stuff down. So again, just as a definition, history is what things people wrote down, which is what we're going to get into. So technically, Stonehenge is prehistory, because it's before stuff was written down, at least in that area. Again, technically pre... Do we not have an extra chair? We got lots of chairs up here. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. We, in my previous classroom last year, we actually would sometimes be short a chair and I would have to let a student use my chair, but the height was weird, so. Anyway, we're gonna get into that in just a little bit. Um, in our actual first chapter, um, because to this day, there are still prehistoric settlements. There are like tribes in untouched regions of the world that don't have a written language and they are therefore prehistoric because they are not using written, written language. So yeah, that's just a little, a little something I like to throw out for all my history classes, even though that's more for my uh, European history. Now, back to this class. Um, and again, if you guys take my, my 103, um, for you online folks, uh, I don't think I'm gonna be doing that online because th those classes barely make, but hey, if you wanna come up here and do it, please do. <laughs> um, we'll get more into that in detail because we have to start way back for, for European history. Um, but for this, uh, we're going to cover a lot of time in a very short period. So, um, starting with the native, native peoples in Americas, um, they first crossed over from Northeast Asia around 16,000 to 14,000 BCE, um, although, and this actually isn't in the book, but it was something that I saw uh, a news report on while I was writing this. Um, recent evidence shows there was actually inhabitants in North America as far back as 40,000 years ago. Now, whether that was a similar group or another group that got here in a different way and then died out and then the group that crossed uh, over the Bering Strait uh, came later because we get a lot of that uh, in different areas where like a group will show up and they'll live for 
a few hundred, maybe even a few thousand years, and they'll die out. But yeah, we've, we've had human habitation in North America for as, long, as, long, as far back as 40,000 years ago. So the, native, the, the people who become the Native Americans uh, cross over the land bridge between Siberia and Alaska um, in what is currently the Bering Straits. Uh, this was known as Beringia. This was during the Ice Age, so there was a lot of ice. And also, with so much ice, the uh, global ocean levels were lower. Uh, so it was a land bridge, and also a lot of ice, uh, as I said. And this was still during the time of uh, hunter-gatherer groups, so rather than having villages to settle down in. They just followed the groups of animals that they hunted. So they followed mammoths, musk oxen, woolly rhinoceroses, that sort of thing. Um, and as they progressed through this new land, uh, some did gradually begin to settle. Um, others settled along the coast, beginning in Alaska and as I mentioned to my uh, Tuesday, Thursday class, uh, I, they had a course in, at Tri-County that when I taught upstate, that was basically this class, but like specifically uh, technology. It was like I was teaching literally this stuff, but the way the technology evolved alongside it. So like they started with spears and then the people that stayed in Alaska like tied ropes to their spears and made them harpoons. And then the people who moved in the, the plains turned them into like bows and arrows and that sort of thing. So yeah, the people who stuck it out in Alaska had harpoons because they hunted whales and seals and whatnot. Um, some folks moved inland, others went down the Pacific coast, um, because by about 10,000 years ago, the mammoths and other large game had gone extinct, uh, due in part to the receding of the ice caps and the, uh, these large, uh, the large megafauna being not, unable to survive in the, the changing world. So again, skipping literally thousands of years. Uh, so by about 3,000 years ago, about 1,000 BCE, uh, these groups began to gradually settle down into small communities. Um, and once you start to settle down, you're able to have larger populations because it, when you're constantly moving around, it's harder to keep the children alive. Uh, Horticulture, which is a very simple form of agriculture. You have little, little plots of land, simple tools, um, developed in modern-day Mexico. Now, again, this is roughly 1000 BCE. Um, lots of other stuff going on in Europe at the time, but, well, we'll get to that. And we'll get to some of the bigger stuff going on in North America in just a little bit. So this is an image of uh, Beringia, because you have modern day Bering Strait, but if you just push the water levels down a little bit, you see where it's shallower. And again, with ice, it's just it's a land bridge. And because when I was uh, creating this PowerPoint, I was like, I need more than just a map. So here's a woolly rhinoceros, if you don't know what they look like. It's, it's a rhinoceros with hair. And a mammoth. Because, you know. Also, um, these are what the early settlements look like. Based on 
the archaeological evidence we found. Um, typically very small huts uh, in the center with the uh, crops radiating outwards. Uh, as you can see, the huts tended to have little holes in the top. Is my mouse showing up? Oh no, my mouse can't show up there because it's on. There we go. Um, because they would have their, their fires inside and due to the way they were set up, they would pull the air in through the door and then the smoke would go out to the top. Uh, it was very efficient for, for what it was. Um, and uh, I mean, yeah, it worked for, for where they were. I mean, especially you start getting down into Mexico and South America, it was so uh, warm and tropical, you didn't really need to worry about keeping warm. Okay, so let's get into the big three. We're going to talk about Native Americans in the Americas. We've got to talk about the Aztecs, the Maya, and the Incas. So by the early 16th century, we had the Maya, the, the Aztec, the Maya, and the Incas. Uh, the Aztec and the Mayan societies were around the equator, um, largely in Mexico and Central America. Um, and then uh, the Inca were along the Pacific coast, which is basically all of modern day Peru and even beyond. And because uh, we have to get to other stuff, um, the book could only give so much space to each, so I can only give so much space to each. So here they are, really quickly. Um, 1325, again, I'm only really giving you guys years as a sort of timeline to show how much time we're having to skip, because the last one was literally like 1000 BCE, and now we're like 2,000 years in the future. Um, so we have the Aztecs who call themselves the Mexica, uh, built their capital that word. Um, I had a student last year, I think. Yeah, I had a student last year who could say that because he was really into the Aztecs. Um, anyway, this capital is built in the site of present-day Mexico City. We'll actually get into why that is uh, a little bit later. Now, the Aztecs were semi-nomadic, so they did a lot of traveling around while they did have villages to, like, settle in. They still, I mean, I guess this is the only way I could think to describe it is like army ants, where they would have places they'd stay, but then they'd swarm out and, like, conquer places, and then they would, like, settle, and they would swarm out and conquer places, and then they would settle. Um because they would conquer all sorts of, of other tribes, but rather than just like burn everything down, they would use the knowledge of the people they conquered in order to make themselves stronger. So they gained a lot of information in regard to irrigation, cultivation, written language, which again, pulls them out of the prehistoric uh, bent, and in fact, makes it so we know a lot more about them than we would otherwise because they're able to write down stuff about themselves. Now, granted, a lot of that got destroyed thanks to the conquistadors. But, you know. So the Maya, um, a bit further to the east, uh, set around the Yucatan Peninsula in the rainforest of modern-day Guatemala. Uh, between about uh, 900 BCE and 300 CE. Again, that's a big span of time. But we have spotty records at best because, again, the conquistadors burned a lot of stuff. Um, we do still have a lot of, well, I'll show you images of a lot of their large stone cities uh, and temples. Uh, they also had some substantial understanding of mathematics, uh, passage of the stars. Uh, around 800 CE, their civilization began to, to 
decline. It was due in part to drought and probably um, internal fighting because, you know, any large civilization is going to have their own internal conflict. Uh, eventually, they remerged into city-states and were trading with the Aztecs by the early 16th century, which is to say the early 1500s. Um, now, I was mentioning this to my Tuesday-Thursday course. Um, if you're not familiar with what a city-state is, because this is something we talk about in, again, my European course, um, a city-state is like well, I mean, it's kind of in the name. It's like each city is their own independent government. Like, they might all consider themselves uh, Maya, but there is no, like, overarching Mayan government. They, they each take care of themselves. Again, to go back to my European history class, like, the ancient Greece... Each city was its own independent government. They fought each other a lot. But they all considered themselves Greek. But they hated working together. There was, there was a whole lot to that. So same idea here. So they weren't nearly as strong as they were before. Because they wouldn't work together. Anyway, finally we have the Incas. Um... They built their society on the back of previous civilizations, which is to say they conquered previous civilizations and used their stuff. Um, these were the Andes of, the, uh, of South America. Um, now, their success was in the fertile mountain valleys. Uh, again, if you're familiar at all with how, like, geology works, I mean, we're close enough to, well, I guess we'd have been close, closer when I was teaching in Tri-County. But um, we're close enough to the mountains to kind of understand how, you know, if you're, if you're a farmer, you don't want to be a farmer on the mountain because <laughs> there's nothing there. Uh, but down in the valley is where, when it rains, it pulls all the, the silt down the mountain. And then at, in the valley, that's where all the good stuff is. Um, so they had all these mountain valleys, and their capital, Cusco, was right there in the middle. Uh, they're very advanced with roads, cities, intricate temples, all sorts of, of good stuff. Um, in fact, uh, as we will see in just, well, probably not, to, not today, but in a future class, the uh, capital of the Aztecs um, was seen by the invading uh, Span Spaniards, the conquistadors, it was seen as equivalent to Venice in Europe, you know, the, the Italian city-state, Venice, which at the time was considered like the most advanced city in the world. So they're coming in here and being like, oh, these, quote, savages have a city as advanced as our greatest city. Let's burn it down. And they did. So anyway, here's the Aztecs. Oh, right, this reminds me. Um, I don't know if it was this lake in particular, but there was a, there was a specific lake in the, the Aztec, uh, the, the, the Aztec territory, finding words here. Um, that they considered sacred and they would throw sacrifices into. Now, normally when you think of Aztec sacrifices, you think of them like, you know, tearing hearts out of people. Well, not in this instance. Um, the Aztecs had a lot of gold to the point that they didn't see it as especially valuable. They're like, oh, this is nice, it's shiny, it's easy to work with, we can make all sorts of stuff out of it. Let's make fancy things and throw it in the lake to appease our gods. And then the Spanish found out about it. They're like, oh, we're going to go in this lake and take this gold. Um, and due to the particular uh, I'm 
trying to think of the right word for this. Due to the nature of this lake, it killed a lot of Spanish. Like the bottom was muddy, so it would like suck your feet down and you couldn't see anything once you were down there. And people just died trying to get the, the gold out of this lake. Um, and then like a thousand years later, you know, the, the 1900s, uh, I guess not a thousand years later, a few hundred years later, Mexico as a country was like, you know, there's a lot of gold in this lake. Let's drain the lake and get to it. That'll be a lot safer. And it still killed a bunch of people. So like maybe leave the Aztec gold alone, the guys. Yeah, as the, the Aztecs were, uh, were, were something else. Anyway, here's a, a painting of, of their temples while they still had like the decorations and stuff on them. Because again, like the Greeks, they tended to use a lot of, um, what's, what's the name of the paint? Um, it's the type of paint that uses, the, uses egg. It's on the tip of my tongue, I don't remember what it's called. Tempura, tempura paint. Um, so it's very bright and colorful, but it's also organic. So it will just like flake off after a few years. Um, and obviously when it's left out in the jungle for like hundreds of years, it's just gonna flake off and peel away. Um, and that's why like when you think of modern, when you think of, uh, again, going back to Greece, uh, Greek statues, you're like, oh yeah, these beautiful marble statues, like they weren't, they weren't supposed to like that. They were like painted up. They're typically pretty gaudy, actually. <laughs> so here they, here's what a lot of them look like today, um, which again is like, what's amazing to me, just by, besides just the temple that is hundreds, if not thousands of years old, um, is that this is in the middle of a jungle and the groundskeeper manages to keep it this clean. Like I live near woods and like my yard is about overtaken because I just don't want to deal with it. And they are in the middle of the tropical jungle and it's, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping they're paying that groundskeeper well. I mean, this was the sort of stuff where, like, they had explorers walking through the jungle and they'd just, like, fall in a pit and be like, oh, there's a temple here. Because they'd just be walking along, it's like climbing up rocks. Like, oh, these aren't rocks, this is this. Yeah. Um, this, this also shows the Toltec civilization. We're not going to worry about them. They're a, a group that the Aztecs absorbed early on. They were very important in Aztec history, but again, we can't really get into that. We don't have time. Um, here's the Maya over here. They had basically all the Yucatan Peninsula to themselves, um, which is not a bad place to be. Here's some Maya stuff. It's really, they knew what they were doing, I guess. They were very advanced in math and science. And then we have the Inca, which again, like all of Peru and I think a little more than Peru. Now, um, I hope nobody uh, gets vertigo because this is what one of their most uh, famous settlements is. I think this is Cusco. Yeah, my cousin went here actually. She she took an she took a picture from very nearly this spot. Also, there's just like alpacas roaming around up here. You go up here and you're trying to take pictures and there's alpacas just like in your face. Okay, so 
Um, that's Central and South America. Now, obviously, since we're doing American history, we're going to be slightly more north than this. So let's discuss the cultures in the north. Now, we don't have too many real specific ones, but I'll point the specific ones out. Um, we have some Angolan potters, Hohokram uh, yeah, irrigators. Um, they were doing stuff that was similar to, but less advanced than the Aztecs and Mayas. Um, don't need to worry too much about them. This is a group that are going to continue to come up, and they're just really neat. So I'm going to talk about them. They're probably going to be on the test. The Pueblo. Um, again, I'm just putting the years because I'm just showing you guys what kind of time frame we're working in. So the Pueblo, around 750, um, built houses cut into cliffs. Um, about 100 years later, they moved into, to the south, building these large, free-standing homes. Uh, but then a drought pushed them back to their, their cliff houses. Um, we'll actually go back to them later with, uh, with the Spanish missionaries and whatnot. But I have to mention the Pueblo because... Well, I'm going to show you pictures, and this is really cool what, what they did with their, their homes, because we've still got stuff that, uh, that has lasted to the modern day. Um, we also have tribes that lived in, along the plains, following herds of bison, so a lot more nomadic, a lot more like, you know, the really old uh, way of living. Uh, they used a spear-throwing device called an adattle for hunting, um, but they were not very large in number due to being nomadic. Now, I want to uh, go ahead and nip a potential misconception in the bud before we get started. Um, horses are not native to North America. The idea of like Native Americans hunting buffalo on horses does not start until Europeans arrive and horses get away from the Europeans and start like breeding in the wild and then the Native Americans get a hold of them and like, hey, we can use this. Um, so they were hunting bison on foot. Like you had to sneak through the brush and like get close enough and then yeet a spear at one and hope you hit it in somewhere important, and then also hope you didn't get run over in the stampede, because bison are big. If you've ever seen like a really big bull, take that and roughly double it. I've been, let's say, too close to a bison, and they're big. Uh, we also have the Chumash tribe along the Pacific coast. Um, they were a hunter-gatherer group, but also they used fishing. Now, this wasn't like, you know, rod and reel fishing, obviously, or even spear fishing. They would set up fish traps along rivers where they would like build almost like a dam in the river. It was, it was more like a fence of, of sticks. And then in the middle, they would have like a, um, like a long basket. And the fish could swim in, but if they tried to swim back out, they had like sticks pointing back the other way, so the fish couldn't swim back the other way out. It, it was almost like a crab basket. Um, and if I remember right from my other book, um, they didn't, um, they were the only group who did not, out of all of these, who never actually had a, uh, any kind of uh, famine because they, had, they always had a supply of fish. Uh, let's see, it says, the Chumash, who vil whose villages sometimes held a thousand inhabitants, participated in regional exchange works up and down the coast. Um, 
as many as 300,000 people may have lived along the Pacific anniversary of societies before the arrival of the Europeans. So yeah, the Chumash weren't like a single tribe, like a single village. They were a group of people, which all of these are groups of people. Um, but yeah, they were very successful because fish are a high protein, high caloric uh, food source. Why do you think bears like just wait at the top of waterfalls for them? And finally, we have the hope well. Um, so the hope well were not a single tribe, not even really a single culture. Um, and again, I, this is a typo. I need to I need to go back and fix this eventually. They were like a a confederation of many different groups that shared similar similar culture, similar ideology, they traded among one another. It was kind of an alliance, but the book never really talks about like any kind of um any kind of real like military anything. Um it was just like a it was just a big group of people working together. And I'll show you a map in a little bit of how many different groups there were, but they spread from, it was basically the entire Mississippi River Valley, which is to say from the Gulf Coast to Canada, from Texas to Florida, like just all the way up. Um, and when I say here, numbering four to 6,000 people, that was like per village. That's not supposed to be the whole, the whole group. That's per village. Uh, they built earthen mounds, uh, earthworks, burial mounds, etc. Uh, those, they still are there. They're just not as visible as like the big stone temples in Central and South America. Uh, but I'll show you some, some instances of those as well. Okay. So here's the Pueblo houses. Again, very well preserved. Uh, this one's particularly good because it's zoomed out so you can see how large they were. Um, you know, you just build it under a cliff and you've got a lot of uh, natural shelter. Obviously, there, there would have been like thatch roofs, but those tend to not last as long as the brick. What's that? Say that again. Um. Yeah, I believe. I think it would have been. Um. Like we don't even use brick as a roof today. So yeah, it, it wouldn't have been very stable. But yeah, they they would use probably some kind of plant matter as a roof, or even like in the desert. Maybe even just not. It's like we've got a cliff. It keeps us keeps the rain off of us, so it's just fine. <laughs> and then, of course, the um, the plains tribes. You know the what, what we think of because after the uh, the Spaniards had gotten done wiping out most of everything to the west, and we had done gotten and by, by we I mean. Uh, England and France had gotten done wiping out everything to the east. The the Plains natives were like the only ones left, and that's what we typically think of. Um, but again, they were they were on foot, and this is largely what they had when it came to hunting. Uh, it extended the uh, the force of the throw so they could throw these spears more efficiently. I mean, any little extra length, if you know anything about physics when it comes to um, like the uh, the pivot of of a throwing arm it really does help
and then the Chumash, although this might be further north, using whale bones for uh, holding up their, their huts. And then this is the Chumash region in California, so Southern California. And then we have the Hopewell earthworks. Now a lot of these, as you can see, are you know, digital recreations because over time, they've just kind of been buried by uh, plant matter and re relative growth. Um, but you can still see some here, which they just look like little hills. But if you see them from a larger point of view, you can tell what they are. Which again, having been to and studied in Ireland, um, these actually look very familiar because they did a lot of this in the, the, the native Irish did a lot of this, a lot of these earthen uh, works. Now, I can't say for sure what, what the Native Americans were up to, but I know the Irish were, were worried about the fairies getting them. Oh, here's the map. Yeah. Like, from Texas to the... the to the Atlantic even, and then all the way up well into Canada. And these were all different cultures, as you can see. These were all different groups, but they were all part of the overall Hopewell cultural exchange. So yeah. Again, not these half-naked uh, savages huddling in the woods that the Europeans would, would treat them as. But, speaking of Europeans, let's go to Europe and see what they're up to before we, we finish up today. So, to the Mediterranean. Let's, um, let's just cut out all of History 103 and go straight into History 104. Um, so in Europe, uh, so mid-1500s, Islam was putting pressure on Western Europe, there was the Crusades, lots of genocide, you know how that works. Um, so the Crusades wanted to establish uh, Christian settlements in the Middle East, but it didn't work. Uh, it did push for more uh, desire in... Europeans exploring. There was also this whole issue of, well, the Muslims are right pissed at us and they won't let us go east to China anymore. So we got to figure out a different way to get there. Um, now before all this, uh, back in the 1270s, Marco Polo had traveled to China to introduce Europe to all these exotic ideas and items and whatnot. Um, and he did do a lot of traveling. He also made up a lot of stuff. Um, I'll get into that in a little bit. Now that said, trading with these far off lands wasn't always beneficial because, hey, long distance travel spreads more than goods. It spreads disease. I wrote this before COVID. <laughs> um, Italian traders in the 1340s brought back the bubonic plague or what was also known as the Black Death killing, killing nearly half the continent in a four year span this was also while France and Britain were fighting the Hundred Years War because they couldn't be bothered to call it off while you know everyone was dying because France and Britain have hated each other for nearly a thousand years For real, if you take my European history course, France and Britain hating each other is one of the major themes. Um, so the play gradually subsided, the economies and culture rebounded, we had the Renaissance, which is where we actually get the term the Dark Ages, because the people in the Renaissance were all real snooty. Um, like, oh, this is a time of light, therefore everything before us was awful. It's like, okay, 
everything right before you was bad because everybody was dying, but like right before that was okay because look at all these fancy like churches and stuff everybody built. The, the Gothic cathedrals were real fancy. But, you know, fine. Paint it all with a broad brush. Um, so, the Renaissance had grand art, new technologies, unified government like Spain and Portugal, which, again, we'll go into this in great detail in my European courses, but uh, as these countries get more powerful, they need more money. And there's two ways to, well, at this time there was one way to get money, and that was to get more land. Now, there's two ways to get land. One way is to go and explore and find more land, and the other way is to wage war <laughs> and take land. And that way is expensive. So, hey, if we can find land that nobody's claimed yet, you know, nobody European anyway, um, let's just go do that. So anyway, here's the Crusades with some very accurate horses. Oh man, that horse is not having a good day. Where's my mouse? There it is. Oh no. What that poor horse. There's one of them Saladin, the head of the uh, the people on top, the ones on top. One of them's supposed to be Saladin. I don't know which one is supposed to be. It's supposed to be the head of the. Oh, there's a head at the bottom. What's going on? Oh, dude, one dude got jibbed. Look, there's pieces. Oh, I didn't notice that on Thursday. There's a hand, there's a head, there's a leg. I don't know. I, I just thought it was like blood. I just thought some dude got like jibbed. 15th century jibbing. Anyway. Oh, speaking of medieval art, I'm going to tease medieval art until we're out of it because it's hilarious. Um, this, I believe, is the siege of, is, this is either Jerusalem or Acre. Um, no, this is the Fourth Crusade. So, did they ever get to a city? It doesn't matter. Because um, we have England, France, and the Holy Roman Empire, a.k.a. Austria. Um, okay, look how tall these guys are. Look how tall these guys are right next to them. Look at the towers and the little people at the top. Okay, fine. But look at the English right next to them. What is this? Yeah, the, the uh, medieval art didn't have perspective. It didn't exist back then. It wasn't invented yet. Yes. Yeah, they're just, yeah. I do like how this horse actually has a lot of detail. There's a gold man. That's probably, um, they're probably the, the, the respective leaders. You've got um, Frederick Barbarossa of the Holy Roman Empire. You've got Philip II of France, and King Richard the Lionheart of uh, England. Here's the various crusades. On the first one, I actually did anything. Here's Marco Polo. Got that hat. Um, now, I am, I am going to, and will continue to, talk crap about these historic characters because, you know, people will simplify what they did just to get on with it. But he, he clearly did a lot of traveling. Um, he also made up a lot of stuff. 
like to to make his adventures sound more dramatic than they were. I feel like they would have been plenty dramatic without making stuff up. But he was like, oh, the Chinese, they breathed fire and had wings on their feet or some. Maybe not that specifically, but I'm not far off. Um, yeah, he, he, he really. And he wasn't the only one. It's not like he made up exaggerating stuff. Anytime somebody went to a place where no, Euro no European has ever been, they made stuff up. I mean, this goes all the way back to Herodotus of, uh, of Greece, uh, which, again, is that's like 700 BCE. What is this? Oh, this is the Black Death. Yay! Do you know what happened in this region where it's relatively unaffected? The, the gray region. Or it's relatively unaffected. That's where the Jews lived. And Jews tended to be clean. Unlike most of Europe. Also, um, prior to the Black Death, the Pope decided cats are evil, murder them. Um, so there was a really major deficiency in cats in most of Europe. But the, the Jews... Uh, weren't beholden to the Pope, so they had cats, and cats tended to get rid of the rats that were, you know, spraying the plague. So, yeah. And then in regions where it was bad, it was bad. Yeah. Again, my European history course, we talk about it for like an entire day. It takes up most of a class. Anyway, the Hundred Years' War was bad, too. It lasted for 113 years. Yeah, he got shot. Oh, yeah, crossbows, like old-timey crossbows, they had cranks because, like, you couldn't, you didn't just pull them back and shoot them. You had to, like, crank them back to, to get them. Yeah. That's why the longbows were better, because you could put like four arrows in a guy before he got done cranking back that bolt. <laughs> um, this is the only Renaissance image I've got, because this is the cathedral in Florence, Italy. Um, this is the first dome made since the fall of Rome. Um, they forgot how to make domes. Like, they lost the architectural ability to make domes. This was the first one made since, like, 700 AD. Okay, we still got a little bit of time, so let's talk about Portugal, so we can at least be caught up with uh, my Tuesday, Thursday class. We're almost done. I promise. Because I let them go a little bit early, so I'll let you guys go a little bit early, but I just want to at least get to where they were. Um, so we'll do a little bit of Portugal, and then what the Portuguese got up to, which is to say not good stuff, and then we'll be done. Okay, so, um, the Italian city-states were extremely powerful. Um, like, each city-state, especially, say, Venice, was as strong as, if not stronger than, most of the major powers in Europe. Like Venice especially. It's, Venice was stupid powerful in, in the Renaissance. I think it was Venice that... I think Venice invented banks because they, the people there were so rich they didn't have anywhere to put their money. Banks were literally secure warehouses to put your money in because they ran out of places to put their money. Venice was ridiculous. <laughs> um... My Italian friend doesn't like talking about Venice because they're snoot. They're still to this day real snooty. Um, so yeah, you can't really trade in Venice. In Venice, you can't really trade in the Mediterranean because the Italian city states are there. Um, can't really go to North Africa because the Muslims are there and they don't like Europeans. Um, can't imagine why. Um, so Portugal's like, well, we need to get to India somehow. Uh, but the only place we can go right now is the Atlantic. And that's not where India is. <laughs> so the person in charge of Portugal was uh, 
Prince Henry, also known as Henry the Navigator, because he liked boats. Um, so he used a very broad approach. Um, he used a lot of uh, navigational knowledge from the Arabic world, which I'm sure got him in a little bit of trouble with the Catholic Church, but I mean, it's like, yo, this is information. Y'all chill out. Because the, the, the Muslims knew what they were doing when it came to a lot of science stuff. They were really ahead of the curve at this time when it came to scientific knowledge. Um, and also hired Italian cartographers and navigators because while Italy was not yet a country, it wouldn't be a country until 1881? Late 1800s. Um, the city-states would very eagerly hire people out to do sailing, and since they were always sailing around the Mediterranean, they were pretty good sailors, pretty good at making maps. Um, so they worked with the Portuguese to try to uh, find an Atlantic route to India. Now the problem was, since most uh, European sailing was in the Mediterranean or in the North Sea, but you didn't want to go to the North Sea because the North Sea was cold and bad, and to this day you don't want to go to the North Sea because the North Sea is cold and bad. Um, you didn't deal with open ocean very much. So the Portuguese uh, developed a new type of ship known as the Caravel, narrow hulls, triangular sails, um, still not really open sea sailing, but good for sailing along the west coast of Africa, which was still much more uh, turbulent than the Mediterranean. Uh, so by 1487, they had a trading post and fort on the Gold Coast, which is modern-day Ghana. Bartolomeu Diaz surrounded ca the Cape of Good Hope that showed, hey, this continent actually ends. Thank God. <laughs> we were worried it went on forever. Um, now, they called it the Cape of Good Hope because, again, thank God it ended. Um... Does anybody know what lives off the Cape of Good Hope? Or, to put it a little easier, off the, ca off the coast of, say, South America? That would be of particular concern for people in a wooden boat? What type of sharks? There's pirates in the Mediterranean. Great white sharks. This is where great white sharks live. Yeah, if you fell off, if you fell off the boat in the Cape of Good Hope, um, you were gone. Especially if they were hungry. I mean, not that great whites like specifically target people. I don't want to like make that assertion, but they've never seen sharks this big. Anyway. Uh, Bartolomeu Diaz is important. Vasco da Gama is more important because he made it all the way around uh, Cape of Good Hope uh, in 1497 to India and returned to Portugal two years later because it's a long-ass trip. Um, and his ships were loaded with exotic and expensive spices because, you know, that's the whole reason was to get to India and get, get the good stuff. Yeah, Portugal. Um, Portugal was the top dog for quite some time. All right, let me. We're going to do one more slide before we finish. So here's um, Prince Henry the Navigator. Should have gotten a portrait rather than a statue. This isn't very flattering. 
Um, that's the Caravel, and I don't know, it looks like Unity Generator. Uh, Bartolomeu Diaz. We're going to see a lot of these portraits that are that are, are clearly very symbolic. Like he's he's holding, I think that's an astrolabe. It's a it's a navigation tool, and it's making it very clear that he's a he's an explorer. Um, the sword at his hip, which is same with um, Vasco da Gama here, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that he's a warrior. It means he's a no he's nobility. Uh, again, uh, De Gama here holding a map in his hand showing that he's an explorer. Um, he also, with the armor and the, uh, the necklace with the cross showing that he's working uh, to also spread Catholicism. Uh, and both of them, as you can see, have like a ship in the background to further show their explorer status. Like this, that's a big thing in, in portraits is to like have all these, all this symbolism behind. There's even like symbolism with the colors that they're wearing and how they're standing. I don't know all of that, but what's that? Yeah. And like even the, like he could, the, the, I think that's the old Portuguese flag there behind him. I mean, just everything. These are the various explorations. Da Gama there in, blue, in green. Yeah, I don't know why it went way out in the Atlantic like that. Okay, one. Uh, no, we got two more. One more. We're not. We're not gonna. I guess we're gonna be one behind, but it's okay. Um, so Portugal had taken control of the Indian trade from the Arabian fleets. They had trading posts and extended their reach to Indonesia, China, and Japan. Um, so Portugal was on top of international trade. Um, the other nations had to catch up. Um, so the other Europeans were expanding their reach and therefore they had to expand their means of taxation and their means of waging war. Um, so they had to also expand their economies, um, but this expanded economic output required something new, uh, which is to say slavery. Now, slavery wasn't new in terms of hum uh, human history. It's been around since forever. But slaves were typically captains of war, or like it was an indemnity for a crime that they did, you know, like modern day prison in America. Um, and even then, slavery wasn't inherited. Like if you were taken prisoner and, you know, you're if you were taken captive in a war um, and had a kid, your kid wouldn't also be a slave. Um, but the European push into the African slave trade did change uh, how slavery was done in Europe. Because the old way was, well, like I said, like how the Greeks and the Romans did it. And like, there's a particular tale of um, a, a Greek slave being taken by the Romans. And, like, his job was to tutor the Roman general's children. Like, it certainly wasn't being worked to death in the fields. So, slavery is always bad, but it certainly has gotten worse uh, throughout history. And the Portuguese uh, really got in on the transatlantic slave trade. Um, now normally I do one more slide, but we are almost at the end, and I'll let you guys go a little bit early. Um, but 
look forward to more ridiculous medieval art next time. All right, see y'all on Wednesday. Uh, I'm going to mute this. But yeah, uh, we'll have discussion stuff on Wednesday. Take care.